Sneakers and Cleats, the podcast. Welcome back to the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. It is Thursday, April 18th. This is episode 93. I'm Matt Roy, back in better than ever after a elongated vacation. We'll see about the better than ever part, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I, my liver's not as good as it was before I left, but everything else is fine. Went to Vegas, went to Nash Vegas, and now I'm home. So Did you lose some hearing? Did I lose Sounds hearing? like you're talking louder than What's, I'm excited what, to be what, here. What was the weather like in Nashville? It was actually a little cold. Yeah. It was a little cold. It was rainy, but the wedding we went to was inside. It was lovely. Congratulations to both of the happy couples that uh, we went to weddings for. First wedding was Haley and Hunter in Vegas. Second wedding was Morgan and Matthew. In You're at that Nashville. age where all, all your friends are getting married. Every other weekend, it seems. Which yeah. wedding was better? Which Rank. wedding was better? Rank them. They were very different. They were very different weddings. So one so one was plated. One was uh, more on, or, hors d'oeuvre. You know, it, it was it was nice. One was wedding. expensive and one was cheap. I love everyone. <laughs> well, the one that was hors d'oeuvre was at Mandalay Bay, so I don't know if it was cheap. Oh, that's not, a, that's not cheap. It's not cheap. <laughs> but anyway, happy to be back. Uh, thank you, Zach, for filling in uh, while we were away. Listen to both of them. Wonderful conversation on the Spurs. A lot of stuff happening. Um, we got a lot going on today. Victor Wembanyama is... Uh, getting some uh, hype for Defensive Player of the Year, which is a little bit unexpected since Rudy Gobert is such a favorite. But we'll talk about a couple of people who have already announced that they're going to be voting for Victor Wembanyama for first place in Defensive Player of the Year. Plus, The Ringer just came out with an exclusive interview with Wemby. Uh, Wemby had some interesting things to say, including the fact that maybe people have already reached out to him to team up here in the Alamo City. That'll uh, perk some ears up, that's for sure. Plus, C.D. Lamb, Micah Parsons are not at voluntary OTAs. Big deal or not? You be the judge. Uh, but first, as always, number 93, we start with our number game. Not very many good 93s. A couple of great ones, but not very you know notar notable ones. Dwight Freeney, for everyone in Indianapolis, 125 and a half sacks, Hall of Famer, John Randall of uh, Vikings lore. Texas A&I Havelina. There you go. That's what we rely on Don for to come up with the uh, the obscure colleges. Um, Calais Campbell, 105 and a half sacks. He'll be, probably be in the Hall of Fame. And then did you know the Meta World piece uh, was 93? Did not remember that. Yeah, 93. I think he was with the Kings, 06, 07, 08. So uh, what I remember 93 for, though, is the Cowboys beating the ever-loving crap out of the Bills. I was there. You were there for the Michael Jackson halftime show, too? Yep. How was that? Was that in ranking of halftime shows? When you're in the building, it's never great. Uh, I can't remember a, a Super Bowl. I think I've been to 10 Super Bowls. I can't remember a, a one that wasn't better that when you finally see it on TV, it was much better because it's so the place is so big. Mm -hmm. uh, Katy Perry came in from this from the roof on a horse wasn't that, or wasn't something. Wasn't that Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga came in from the roof. Uh, Katie no, Perry. Katy Perry was on a big old horse. Yeah, that was later in the show. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. He yeah, did. and and we couldn't see it, but you see on TV, it's very impressive. Uh, the whole uh, wardrobe malfunction with um, <laughs> Justin Timberlake and, and, and Janet Jackson had no idea that it even happened when you're in the building. So they're definitely made for TV events. Yeah, the one that I wanted to be at was Prince in Miami in the rain. And yeah, was not at that Super Bowl. Purple rain. But yeah, Michael Jackson was great at the time. Yeah, but that Super Bowl was just. It was so over. fantastic. It was also over before it started. Yes, so, yes. Um, that final score ended up being 52 to 17. Correct. Uh, Troy Aikman, Super Bowl MVP. Emmett Smith was the regular season MVP, not of technically that year, but the year following since it was in 93. Uh, for baseball, the Rockies and the Marlins played their inaugural seasons in 93. The Marlins have subsequently won two World Series, and the Rockies don't know what the playoffs look like. So that's nice. Uh Chuck's Blue Jays defeated the Phillies in four game or in six games, four games to two. Joe Carter hit a walk-off home run to end the series. The second time in MLB history that the World Series ended on a walk-off hit. Can you name the first, Don? No, I can't. I did not put it on the rundown because I wanted to quiz you. Give me the decade. Uh the 60s. It's early 60s. Not Mazeroski. Yes. It was Mazeroski's home run. Damn, see, look, that, look at you. That's pretty good. Yeah, Pittsburgh. Bill, Bill Mazeroski, Game 7. Pirates defeat the Yankees. Only walk-off uh, Game 7 home run in the World Series. All right. So, fun facts for everyone out there. And then in basketball, of course, this is the 
Final year of the first three-peat for the Bulls. They defeated the uh, Charles Barkley Suns 4-2. to two. That was the infamous John Paxson game um, when Phil Jackson's like, who's open? Pax. Well, get it to him then. So he <laughs> got it to Pax and he made the shot. And, and little known fact, uh, from the summer of 92 and the Dream Team, through that entire regular season and even in the postseason, Charles Barkley was the best player on planet Earth. He was better than Michael Jordan. He carried the Suns that year. He was way, by far, the best player on the Dream Team that summer, along with David Robinson and, and Michael Jordan and all those guys. But, you know, people people remember Michael. Of course, he's the greatest player of all time or whatever, and that was the end of his three-peat. But Charles was the best player. And, and here's another thing. In 04, similarly, Manu Ginobili, leading Argentina over the U.S., through the 05 finals when he should have been MVP against the Pistons, or could have been, um, Manu Ginobili was the best player on planet Earth, uh, despite Tim Duncan and others being Kobe and all them. It was, it's like a golfer who gets in a groove and wins three or four tournaments or wins player of the year like Nick Price did in the 90s where – he, I mean, he was in the top 10 every week and just Manu and Charles had those grooves for about a year, not much longer than that, where they could actually claim they were the best, best player on the planet. I might be on the, um, in the minority here, but I believe that if Charles Barkley didn't win the MVP that year, that the Suns might have beaten the Bulls and the Bulls might not have won because, have because it, so gives, it gives you so much motivation. Yeah. And Michael, Michael lived Jordan. for that kind of motivation. And he did that the same thing with Carl uh, Malone later on against yeah. the Jazz. I mean, if if players if he's not slighted and he has nothing to motivate him, if nobody ever talked to Michael Jordan, I don't think he would have been as great as he was. But anytime anyone said anything, he ended up just putting it, was, it on the bulletin board. So I'll never forget being at the Hall of Fame when he was inducted because David Robinson was inducted at the same time. Michael Jordan's speech was like the worst speech of all time because all he did was talk about grudges the entire time. Mm -hmm. There was no, not a lot of gratitude, not a lot of thank yous, but it was, I knew I was better than you, and I knew I was better than you, and I knew I was better than you. He brought, he flew the guy that beat him out for the last spot on the varsity in high school. He flew him to the Hall of Fame and sat him in a really good seat so that he could talk about him in his speech and said, you shouldn't have beat me out for that. I'm school. just happy that he gave us the crying Jordan meme. I've been living yeah. on that for years. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get to some content here. So Wemby is – Rudy Gobert, he's a huge favorite. I think he's minus 3,000. He's come down a little bit, actually. But with ballots due this week for player – Wemby has actually started to gain a little bit of steam. Yeah. Chris Broussard on FS1 earlier this week. Said this. He may not win it. It's going to be interesting to see how this goes. But I, I got Wimby winning. I got Wimby at number one. Uh, Joe Barrett at number two. This would be his fourth. He, he, I still, I think Joe, Joe Barrett Bear, probably Joe wins Bear. it. And AD number three. And look, to me, when I look at the numbers and obviously watching the games, the only reason not to pick Wimby is the team was bad. Can you tell right, that Chris Broussard? <laughs> Can you tell that Chris Broussard and Avery Johnson are from the exact same zip code in New Orleans? I don't know if we can trust someone who pronounces it Joe Bear, but that's a little besides the point. Mike Greenberg of ESPN also on his show, Greeny, this week said he was going to vote Wemby uh, the defensive player of the year. He's got at least two votes, but I and he should be. Well, here's the problem. Gobert is going to be on everybody's ballot, either one, two, or three. They, they add up all the points. If Wemby's not on everyone's ballot, though, what the hell, the hell are they getting a vote for? Yeah, well... It, you know, we are we do look at things through black and silver colored lenses. <laughs> uh, it's true. But there's a lot of people that will look at the record and being a rookie. He's going to finish second. He's going to finish second, and that's great for a rookie. He's going to be first team all defense. That's unbelievable. And then he's going to be uh, first – he's going to be the rookie of the year and first team all rookie. I mean, it's going to be fantastic. I think he – I think he should win rookie of the year based. I mean, the defensive player of the year based on his stocks. Um, but steals and blocks for anyone who does steals that. and blocks combined. Yeah, he wins by over a hundred or right at a hundred. 
Um, but yeah, he's a rookie. My thing is like if you took blind resumes and you just looked at a- yeah. AD compared to Rudy Gobert compared to Victor Wembanyama, didn't you took look them, at team success. Didn't look at team success. Yeah, he win. He win one hundred percent of the time. It's not even close. Like his when you but take the Spurs him, were like dead last in in defensive rating. But when as you a take team. but when you take him off the floor, they are the worst team defensively of all time. Yeah, like the fact that I think it's a plus seven is what they were when he was on the floor as compared to off the floor. It makes them middle of the pack defensively. And he as just compared kept getting to better. He had six, he averaged six blocks a game. I saw baseball. someone, I saw someone's argument today. I forgot who it was that they can't vote for Wemby for defensive player of the year because of the 18 game losing streak that the Spurs had. How can you be a defensive player of the year when you have an 18 game losing streak? Well, it's because you were playing a point guard that didn't deserve to be a point guard. And that would have nothing to do with Wemby's defense. People don't look that di- deep dive. But yeah, you're right. Well, why do they have votes then? That's my question. <laughs> like, why do these people have votes if they're not watching the damn games? Do they go with the narrative? You know, things get popular and people just go with the narrative. The Wemby, Wemby's defensive numbers, if if you put just switched Wemby and Rudy Gobert, he had the same defensive numbers he has right now on uh the Timberwolves. He would oh yeah, they'd be talking about this being one of the best defensive seasons of all time. Yeah, and it's gonna come. It's kind of come. It will, but I mean, it's just frustrating seeing like not him not getting his due when he deserves it. Speaking of not getting his due, this is a great time to remind people. You know, when you see Steph Curry get knocked out of the playoffs, and when you see Blake Griffin retire with six uh, All NBAs and whatever six All Star games that he made, Tim Duncan. You ready for this? Tim Duncan was first team all NBA as a rookie. Name another. You won't find any. Tim Duncan was all NBA 15 times. He was all defense 15 times. Look for anybody with those numbers. You won't find any. Preach. Larry Bird was like all NBA eight times and all defense, like none. Magic, none. Michael was like six. Tim Duncan was all NBA 15 times and all defense 15 times. Whenever you start getting off on Tim Duncan, I just back off. I just, I don't want to interrupt. I feel like I went to church. I know. (laughs) Hey, man. I mean, he's so underappreciated. Yeah, you know, since we're since we're there right now, do you can you just give me thirty seconds on? Um, I took it off the rundown. I was going to keep it on, but then the ringer stuff came out. Give me thirty seconds on the people to the people who are saying that Steph and this Warriors team is a better trio than uh, the Spurs team is. Because I've heard that all week after they got eliminated. Oh, this dynasty that the Warriors have is a better dynasty than the Spurs. It's a better trio than the Spurs had. Just you go. Let's- Here's the thing about the Spurs. <laughs> okay, you ready for this? We talked about, you know, Steph missing the playoffs and remember the remember the Warriors last few years in order to get Wiseman and whoever they got in the draft. They they won like 20 games like two years in a row. Tim Duncan and then people are celebrating all over the league. You look at Twitter and you look at these franchises that are going uh whether it was the Timberwolves or somebody. <laughs> We won 50 games celebrating a 50 win season. I've seen all these tweets from the actual uh, Twitter uh, accounts from the organizations celebrating. This is what a 50 win season looks like. Tim Duncan never did not win 50 games. He played 18 years in the league, 19 years in the league, whatever it was. He won 50 games every year, every single year. He never did not make the playoffs. Steph Curry didn't make the playoffs. He made the playoffs every single year. So even though they only won, you know, they went 99, 03, 05, 07. But they were there in 06. They were there in 04. They were there in 08. They were there in 09. They were there in 10. 13. Thir- they were there in. One shot away in 13. In, in 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. They were always knocking on the door. It's hard to win championships. Look at Giannis. Giannis is, hard, you know, finding that out. He's got one. Eight years in, 10 years in, Tim was knocking on the door all the time. Tim Duncan's career lasted twice as long as Magic and Larry's. Magic won five championships, but he won them all in 10 years. Tim Duncan was like Kareem. His first championship and his last championship were like 17 years apart. So 
there's something to be said for longevity and not just longevity, but greatness over longevity. No one won more regular season games than Tim. No one more won more playoff games than Tim. They throw in like guys like Robert Ory or Derek Fisher, these, these guys that were riding on the bus. But Tim was driving the bus. And when you look at all the numbers, he's the winningest player of all time. Him and Manu. I have nothing to add. Um, I just I love getting you on that tangent because it's just <laughs> facts the entire time. It's I, just I always straight I facts. simplify it this way. If Tim Duncan played his career in Boston or New York, he would be ahead of Michael and ahead of LeBron. They would be calling him the greatest player of all time. Uh, let's get back to Wemby real quick. So something that came out this morning, I believe, um, the Ringers, Kevin O'Connor, had a great little exclusive conversation with Wemby. It's a 49-minute video. You can see it on YouTube. Um, we'll play a little bit of it here. Uh, and some interesting things came out of it, one of which is how Wemby looks at his season as a whole and how he looks at being nominated for all these awards and possibly even winning uh, Rookie of the Year, maybe even Defensive Player of the Year. Are you surprised by how much success has come early for you? I mean, all NBA, all D, potentially defensive player of the year, all of this, are you surprised at all? Um, mm, no, I wouldn't say surprised because um, to me it's impossible to be surprised by, you know, by, by your own performance, good or bad, because it's, you know, ultimately everything is a result of your own work and your, you know, mentality. So I, I always want more. Don, I think that kind of just goes to his mentality when it comes to his own expectations of himself, right? I mean, he obviously, his expectations for himself are higher than anybody else's for him. I believe that's true. And so when he comes out and he maybe he wins rookie of the year, if he doesn't win defensive player of the year, I'm sure he'll be like, well, damn, I should have. Like, why, what could I have done? Not, oh, those voters, but what could I have done? to make, put myself in a better position to win those things. You know what's so cool? I noticed this way back when we met him at the uh, draft. Um, he has the same thing that Tim Duncan had as being a basketball nerd. Um, Tim Duncan knew all of Kareem's stats, all of Wilt's stats. They were important to him, championships, all NBA stuff. Wimby's like that too. He's a geek. When you listen to Wimby talk about hoops, he is he's he's a geek on the history. He's a geek on accomplishments. He's a geek on moves and the fundamentals and the basics of basketball. He lives, eats, breathes basketball. He does, he's not just a basketball player. It's his life. And and Tim was that way too. And that's that's a cool a little comparison. It is. And to that point, you'll see in that conversation if you guys watch it, the Kevin O'Connor knows basketball as well. He did a great yeah. job with this interview. And they asked Wemby, like, what can you improve on? And he's like, Well, KD has this little hesitation, this little move that I'm gonna be working on this summer, this defensive thing I'm gonna be working on this summer. He's always trying to improve. He's trying to get people's moves. He's trying to do this, do that, to make sure that he stays one step ahead of the competition. And all the crazy plays that we say, you know, you've never seen anybody do that. They don't just happen. He, you know, he in this interview, he goes into detail about, you know, guarding the pick and roll and then being late for the for the alley oop over to mm -hmm. Chet and leaving early. And have, even though I had my back to the basket, I knew that's where he was. He, he's he's a detail oriented guy into, you know, the sham god move and all those kind of things that that we see him do. Those don't aren't I mean, he does have a lot of innate yeah. things, but he also works on all of that. Those don't just happen by surprise. Right. Like <laughs> it's all practiced in the in the lab somewhere. Um, and to that point, even more as they keep going, and and Wemby continues to get better, people are going to want to play with him, and that might already be happening. Another part of that uh, interview with Kevin O'Connor on the Ringer. Again, you can find that whole thing on YouTube. It's about forty nine minutes long. Um, he said this really interesting thing about people already possibly calling him to team up. It is going to be very interesting to see like how soon things are accelerated there because I'm sure players also recognize that too. Do you? Does anybody talk to you about teaming up already? Um, I've yeah, I've received some like some messages, um, even from like prospects, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I try to stay in my role, and <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, it's. 
yeah, it's it's a whole new world for it's a whole new world and I'm, that I'm eager to discover. But um, for sure, one day or the other, I have to be involved in this. I guess. The last line got me. One day I'll have to be involved in this. I think that means the player acquisition part of it, the recruiting part of it. I just, to me that makes it sound like he doesn't. He's not already a part of it. He doesn't want to be a part of it yet. They they have talked to him, and he picked his brain about the French prospects in the draft. I do not believe they have talked to him about Trey Young or any of these possible names that you get see being thrown out about adding to the to the mix. They didn't really, and Tim didn't. You know, Tim wasn't LeBron or Giannis. You know, Giannis traded Drew Holiday to the Celtics and got Dame Lillard. That was Giannis. It's not working out very well either. And the team did it for him. Tim Tim always sat back and let the, the guys do their job. Now, there were times when they consulted Tim because a lot of times they had to have Tim restructure his contract so they could forward Richard Jefferson or somebody like that that they would bring in. And I, you know that they they consult with, I know they did with Jason, the, the, consulted with Tim when they brought in Jason Kidd and considered him and offered him, but he didn't take when they had Tony Parker already. Tim was consulted. They will consult with Wimby. I got the sense from hearing that soundbite that they haven't done that yet with veterans, but maybe these draft prospects. How different is that? from the way that they've operated in the past. I mean, they've had, like you said, you just went on on your Tim Duncan yeah. glory tour uh, and rant there because Tim Duncan is a top 10, unequivocally a top 10 player of all time, maybe even top five player of all time. But he didn't necessarily want that. He didn't like require that kind of stuff. Kawhi did. And you've said all along that they have learned from the mistakes that they made with Kawhi or learned from the personality that Kawhi had. How different is Wemby now? Maybe his talent level, how different is like how they're going to treat the future with Wemby here? Well, I don't think, I don't think they cared what Kawhi thought about their, um, the pieces around him. Kawhi was not a team player. Kawhi didn't operate within the confines of quote unquote, being a spur. Um, you know, going outside the team for his medical help and not being around the team, training and rehabbing while the team was playing. He really offended Tim, Tony, and Manu. Um, really offended Manu and Tony late. Uh, uh, they were way over over him. Just Tim, but I think. Then. But I think I think um, the Spurs learned from the Kawhi situation in that they maybe didn't understand that some players might might be worth bending your own culture for if it means continuing to win. At the time, I don't think they were going to budge from their culture. And quite honestly, I don't think they should have because of the way that Kawhi acted. But with Wimby, I think they go into it from the very beginning, before he even was drafted, with getting to know mom and dad, getting to know, hiring his physio guy to be a part of the organization, including everything, knowing that in four or five years, he's going to make this decision of whether he's going to stay here long term. So I think they've nurtured that relationship. I think that's something that they learned from from Kawhi. But I think like Tim, um, Wimby obviously wants to have input he he's he's not going to want to have a say. He's not going to be like get this guy. Or, uh, he's a really cool kid, and he trusts the organization implicitly. But you can tell they're going to ask me, and I'm going to need to know who's going to fit best around. Yeah, well, me. kind of what direction we're going. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's also the Spurs kind of learning how to handle this generation of player? Because this generation of players yeah. saw LeBron. D Wade and Bosch team up. They saw Kevin Durant go to the Warriors. They saw all these moves in like the player movement, player empowerment era. Yeah. Do you think it's also the the Spurs learning? Okay, maybe the exact culture we had when David and Tim were here isn't going to fit right now, but we can work it in. Yeah, yeah. I think you you and Pop, nobody's been more flexible with you know with, than Pop. I mean, Pop has completely changed his coaching style mm-hmm. and. I think 
the Kawhi debacle was part of the learning curve of all of that. I still side with the Spurs, the Spurs doctors, and the Spurs organization. Um, with the, they did nothing wrong in that situation, but they learned what could happen if you stick to your guns, whether you're right or wrong. The, the bottom line is they chose to lose over blowing up our culture for one guy, and I think that's admirable. Bob, you have something like to add? Like you said, uh, Pop has changed his coaching style, right? Is it better? Um, I think it's it it's uh. I don't know if it's better or worse. I just don't think you can have it. There's no alternative. If you stayed, if you kept your old coaching style with this generation, nobody would play for you. It's the, the kids are too soft. The thin is the skin is too thin to criticism. I mean, this is a, this is a generation that's grown up being told how great they are. Uh, these are college. These kids never played high school basketball. A lot of them. For teams that matter, they play AAU and they jumped around to AAU teams where they were always the best player. They've never had accountability and been a part of a team. And I've never known a team to win that that didn't have. And you know what's great? Pop built that on this losing team. Mm -hmm. You could see they won 22 games. At the end of the year, you could see that they loved each other. They loved Devontae Graham getting his chance to play and win. They, they had a, It was like a high school team. Yeah. No team has ever won a championship <laughs> that didn't have that kind of camaraderie. And so I personally, Bob, I was upset many times this year. And I talked to, to guys like Malik Rose. I've talked to guys like Sean Elliott, who said, if I did what Jeremy did, I wouldn't have played for a month, you know? And remember he benched Jeremy and he benched Keldon within a, a couple of yeah, days. Yeah, a couple span, of, like a week, yeah. Right, and they were back on the court the next day or whatever. And, you know, you it's, it's weird. They have such thin skin and – you know, to Pop's credit, he's learned how to to bend his. I don't know if it's better or worse. I don't think you have a choice. Do you think that might be one of the reasons we were so surprised this year how few wins they had? Is it Pop is changing his coaching style and he's adapting as well, and maybe not the coach he used to be until he gets this whole thing down? Like I said, the same thing. I was like, twenty games into this thing, it's like, at what point is Pop going to have a team meeting and say, give? the big guy, the <laughs> dang ball now, right? But same thing. People said, tell Wimby, quit shooting threes and get inside. But the genius of Pop, you got to let the kid learn the lesson for himself. Yeah. Because if, if it's all you and he wants to play outside, then he's resentful of you. But if he learns on his own – that he's not an outside player and his numbers go to the toilet. And then you start posting him up and move him inside. And his numbers start going up. He starts having success. Then he learns it on his own. And that's the way I think it was with Jeremy and Devin and all these guys kinda, that weren't passing. Kind of like you just got to let your kids fail to see. You got to let failure. them fail. Um, real quick on the way out. Uh, I want to get to the Cowboys things real fast. So CD Lamb, Micah Parsons missing the offseason program. Micah missed last year, so I don't think that's really a big deal. CD not being there, I think, is interesting. Do you think it's something or nothing with that CD's not there? Nothing. He wasn't there last year. He was in Austin training. Same thing. Do you think it it, it speaks to the uh, um what's the word I'm looking for? Lack of culture. L lack of culture, but also lack of uh uh, I don't know accountability. I guess on the on the management that they they haven't gotten any of these deals done yet. I don't know. I, I can't figure what they're doing. I, I, I don't think they know what they're I'm doing. I'm buying into that theory that the Cowboys are the third or fourth most profitable venture that they have in oil and gas and other things, and that <laughs> they're they're totally looking at the bottom line. They make the same exact amount of money whether they spend more money in the salary cap and win, or whether they go eight and eight. <laughs> so why would waste why waste the money when you can make the same amount of profit. Well, as we learned today, Jerry Jones is spending that money on in Arkansas. So, did you see that? Oh yeah, nil money. Yeah, nil money. He's giving John Calipari his his salary and giving him a boatload of nil money to recruit over to Arkansas. Yeah, the Tyson Chicken guy. Yeah, exactly. I think that's why that's why John Calipari left Kentucky because he's got forty million dollars back into five he, players. He's playing. He was playing golf with the Tyson Chicken guy three days before <laughs> he got the job, and the Tyson Chicken guy gave him six million dollars in nil money. So uh, that's all we got for you today on the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. I did want to ask Don. So today is Viva Fiesta. It's the first day of Fiesta here in San Antonio. So happy Fiesta to everybody. Happy Lu Fiesta. Luis hates it, but I that's okay. Fiesta. We're not going to talk to the Fiesta grouch. Um, 
<laughs> Don, real quick, do you have a favorite Fiesta memory? You've been here forever, so do you have a favorite Fiesta memory? Oh, the f- the food at Nyosa is my memory. Maria's tortillas, at the uh, uh Mr. Chicken, um, beer, yeah. cowboy clops, beignets. Nyos is awesome. The only I love Fiesta. The only thing I hate about Fiesta is the cascaronis. Yeah. Jordan, so they Jordan. crack them on your head, but they end up in your crack. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. They itch your neck and all that stuff. Jordan had one cracked on her head uh, last year when she was on air. Yeah. And the little confetti pieces, somehow, two months later, we found in our washer. I was just like, oh, they get everywhere. Make it. How did I even get there? Uh, Bob, you have a favorite Fiesta food? Oh yeah, chicken on a stick. It's chicken on a stick guy. Yeah. Chicken on a stick guy. I I, you know, it's really good. Mr. Chicken, the the you're talking about the fried chicken on a stick with the jalapeno yeah. on today. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. As long as it's a spicy chicken on a stick, I can do it. They dip it in the jalapeno juice or put the jalapeno well, no, you, on top. They put a jalapeno on top. Yeah, they do that as well. Squeeze, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but, as long as it's spicy, I'm good. The the basic one is it's top my, three. It's that? top three. Um. Anticuchos, which is like a shish kebab with a mm-hmm. a vinegar chimichurri glaze on it. Those are delicious. But number one fiesta food of all time is Maria's tortillas. It's the longest line at Nyosa. It's all of these old ladies patting out fresh corn masa on comals, grilling them hot. They take them off hot, put them on a piece of paper, take a handful of cheddar cheese and a stick of butter. They put the butter on there, and then they put the handful of cheese and close it shut and melts. Oh, one of my gosh. first, one of my so first simple, fiesta, so, ex- it's a heart attack. <laughs> one of my first fiesta experiences. I went in, this is on our way out right now. So, uh, went with Yuli last year. Our, one of our photographers, Ulysses Romero now works in Dallas. Um, we, we went and he was like, we got a couple of tacos and he gave it to me. He's like, I know that's a good taco before even tasting it. I was like, why? He's like, look, who's making it. Yeah. He's, he's like, it's me, Thea right there. I was like, oh, okay. So if it's not some you know, older Latino woman, he doesn't trust it. So oh, that's I, I Maria's it. tortillas, man. I get it. <laughs> and, and they're hot right when you get them. And, oh, it's unbelievable. No, I, I can't wait to get some food in me. So um, stay, staying away from the liquid, though. I, Vegas has still got me. Um, that's all we got for you today on the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. Remember to download, rate, review, subscribe. Give us a five-star rating. Tell a friend, tell an enemy. We'll go over some draft stuff next Monday. Draft is a week from today. We'll see who the Cowboys mess up this time. We'll be right back here on Monday. Until then, everyone have a good weekend.